with Hearth Rhythm TV from Denver, Colorado, this is Dan Elias with the Ice Image of the Month. We are honored to have Dr. Pasquale Santangeli of the Hospital of University of Pennsylvania joining us today. Welcome. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Of course. Oh, well, thank you. Um, you know, our episode or this episode will be actually split into two parts. Part one, um, well, first off, the episode will focus on the posterior superior process and ice imaging. Uh, part one will focus on arrhythmias and ablation from this region. And part two will focus on the gerbodi or trans right atrial access for double mechanical uh, my, uh, my, mechanical valves for VT ablation. So um, we'll get started with our first image here. Um, as you can see here, we have some morphologies of arrhythmias that originate from the posterior superior process and then some ice, and then an ice image. And uh, Dr. Santangeli, will you please, first off, tell us a little bit about these arrhythmias, the morphologies, and, the, and also what is the posterior superior process? Because I suspect our viewership, a lot of people actually don't know what that is. Thank you, Daniel, for the question. And uh, I have to be, to reconstruct the history of this uh, 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 ablation series that we've done, and really, uh, this idea came from my colleague initially, Fermin Garcia. And uh, I participated to the study with uh, after his initial description. And I believe this one actually was his first case um, where we realized that there is some arrhythmias that come from a region in the inferior posterior process, so inferior septal process or posterior superior process of the left ventricle. It basically is the area of the left ventricle that is in direct contact with the red atrium. And that happens in humans because the plane of the tricuspid valve is more apically displaced compared to the plane of the mitral valve which leaves a portion of the septal, basal septal aspect of the, um, uh, of the left ventricle that is in direct contact with the red atrium. So in this case, if you can see here on the left side, there is a sinus beat and there is a PVC beat. Uh, and uh, uh, the PVC is a left bundle with very early transition. And the inferior axis is uh, fairly positive in lead two, and then kind of biphasic, but predominantly positive uh, in lead three as well. Uh, this looks like a Paraisian type of exit on the left side uh, of the septum, most likely. And the mapping process of this uh, uh, procedure here, you can see that the catheter here is deployed in a retrograde fashion uh, down inferior to the non coronary cusp in the a region of the left ventricle uh, here that is the inferior septal process or posterior superior process of the left ventricle right under the junction between the non coronary cusp and the, and the right coronary cusp here. And uh, uh, at this area here, it was able to uh, record a 15 milliseconds, 15 millisecond pre-QRS here. And ablation from this site really didn't result in a sub complete suppression of the PVCs. So we always like to work from vantage points. And the question is, uh, how are we gonna approach this from the opposite side? And ICE was very uh, eye-opening here because you can appreciate that the opposite side of where the catheter is sitting here is really the right atrium. Uh, and here, the portion of the right atrium that you see is right lateral, slightly lateral to the ostium of the coronary sinus, and is in direct contact with the outer portion of the inferior septal process of the left ventricle. This area does not have an epicardial component because the epicardial portion of the uh, inferior septal process is really the right atrium. So the idea, if you go to the next slide, it was to position the catheter opposite in the right atrium and, 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 uh, and basically try to record that signal from there and potentially ablate from that area. And it was successful in this case. And then we published a series of about six cases uh, with these specific um, uh, morphologies here. And they were able to be ablated from the radiation. This is an anatomical picture from the Mech Alpine. And this is actually a, a longitudinal cut through the left ventricle at the inferior septal process or posterior superior process. And you see this yellow area here is the inferior septal process and in direct contact with the red atrium. And again, the reason why that happens is because the plane of the recuspid valve and the mitral valve are in different planes. And therefore there is a portion of the septum that is in contact with the red atrium. Okay, so moving on to our next slide here. Now, this is an area of a lot of, you know, high impact, you know, collateral anatomy, namely the, you know, the the slow pathway, the coronary sinus, and the crux of the heart. Uh, and I love how you've juxtaposed, uh, you know, McAlpine with your ice images here. Will you take a moment again to just describe the anatomic relationships 
in this uh, region and how ICE helps you uh, distinguish all this? Thank you, Daniel. So I think it's really uh, fundamental, the use of ICE in this area, because there is some anatomical variability in between patients uh, in this specific area and really uh, other imaging modalities, including, of course, fluoroscopy, uh, but also CT reconstruction when you try to integrate, they're not as uh, good as the intracardiac echo. So here, if you go from the left side of the screen to the right side here, uh, this is so important because that's the view that we get from actually intracardiac echo. When you advance your probe in the red atrium and you clock your probe slightly, you will see right outside the coronary sinus, you will see portion of the left ventricle. And here you see in the center images what we see with intracardiac echo, exactly like the uh, case that we showed before you have the uh, area of the inferior septal process of the left ventricle. In the top view, the top image, you see a catheter, the, an ablation catheter is deployed in a retrograde aortic fashion, uh, right under the non-coronary cusp in contact with the left ventricular aspect, endocardial aspect of the inferior superior process, inferior septal process. In the inferior view of the eyes, the most inferior panel, you see a catheter is deployed on the opposite side, which will be from the right atrium and is touching the uh, opposite side of the inferior septal process. This is the same case, I believe it's case number one that Firminger C has done and then we published together afterwards uh, after this. And again, you can see the close proximity of the two catheters and that in this particular case, suppression of the PVC was really achieved from the right atrial aspect of the inferior septal process. Here um, on the right side, you see another uh, anatomical drawing that shows basically uh, that the planar tricuspid annulus is a little bit more apical compared to the planar domacial annulus. And there is a portion of the red atrium, which is in purple, it's also right, a red atrium here, that is in direct contact if you basically peel it off with a PSP, which is a posterior superior process of the left ventricle. And this again, this is an area uh, where we can also potentially ablate accessory pathways, for example, that inserts from the red atrium and it ends in the left, in, in the, in the left ventricle. The slow pathway region is a little bit more paradoxically lateral to this. It's actually at, in the plane of the tricuspid valve, but they're very close to each other, really. And uh, uh, but the slow pathway region is really at right is more close to the right ventricular insertion of the septum. It's slightly more lateral. And uh, inferior to this, if you go all the way epicardial and slightly more lateral at the takeoff of the MCV, you will have the so-called cardiac crux region, which really is a, is a, is a small area where. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, different structures nearby, but specifically the posterior superior process is a, a peculiar area that is in between the cardiac cracks and the non-coronary cusp, and is covered entirely by the red atrium, and there is no epicardial component to it. Well, thank you. That's that's a fantastic summary. Um, you know, as somebody, you know, I love your images, and I love your images even more if I look at them in the mirror. Um, Will you tell me a little bit more, you know, as someone who didn't train at Penn, about the right-left inversion from the defaults and, and kind of the reasoning behind doing that for your dice images? Yeah, so, and uh, before uh, going to Penn, I was trained like the rest of the world, so it took a little bit of a while for me to change. And, uh, and so the question that, I, that everybody would ask is, why are you guys doing ice uh, the other way around? Uh, this was actually introduced by Dr. Ren, which is, a, a, I would say, a pioneer of intracardiac echo, and it was working with Frank Machinisky years ago. So the most, uh, I would say, rational explanation for that is that uh, if you look at the ice pitch when you deploy your intracardiac echo catheter in the red ventricle, and if you look at the left ventricle in a, in a long axis view, that replicates the same uh, uh, view that you see with transthoracic echo. You have the apex of the left ventricle on the left side of the screen, the base on the right side of the screen and the RV on the top of it. And that replicates exactly what you see with TTE. Also from an anatomical perspective, if you flip the images like we do, any left-sided structure will be on the left side of the screen, like the left atrium, and any right-sided structure will be on the right side of your screen, which would be the right atrium. These are the two explanations, but honestly, I think ice works no matter what, uh, either the way we do it or the way the rest of the world does it. So. Flip it or not, ice is fantastic. Yeah. So um, we'll go on to your another example case that you sent me, and you know you you're again here now uh, accessing the PSP. It looks like from the coronary sinus, but to me it looks like you're deeper into the coronary sinus. Is this is this an example of a variation potentially in this anatomy a little bit, or tell me a little bit more about what we're seeing here? Yeah, here we actually, you can see the coronary sinus coming into place here, but we're really slightly outside the coronary sinus. Yeah. In fact, you see sometimes during the heart beating, 
you see the uh, valve of the uh, ostium of the primary sinus comes into view there. So we're slightly outside. When you ablate from within the coronary sinus, there are some reports of ablation of BT, for example, from there, right from the ostium of the coronary sinus between the ostium and the MCV. You still will target the left ventricle there, but technically it's the epicardial aspect of the uh, macular annulus at that point, really, when you go inside the coronary sinus. It's not the PSP any longer. In this view, uh, maybe a little bit misleading, you see the coronary sinus, but you're still actually outside, slightly outside the coronary sinus in the uh, targeting the radial aspect of the uh, posterior superior process of the left ventricle. Um, so here, this what this slide shows is that uh, this was another case that was actually done with prior ablation, if you look at the uh, artifact there. And the reason why that was done, and I believe this was done also by my colleague, Dr. Garcia, and um, here, um, you, you can, uh, this case was done beforehand and it was uh, felt as a paraecian case and it was ablated in the red ventricular side. Uh, and basically they ended up having a, a PVC suppression, uh, which was du durable, but they also injured the red band of branch. In this case, in fact, this PVC was targeted more septal to it, more septal to the paraecian region in the posterior superior process. Of the, um, uh, of the left ventricle from the radiation. And the reason cryo was used in this case, this was very early on, and then we used our radio frequency afterwards, because it wasn't really clear, uh, at least to us, whether this approach would result in injury of the conduction system. And with cryo, we felt a little bit more safe to just monitor the conduction uh, during the ablation, because there you can injure potentially the complex AV node, although we haven't seen anything like it so far. Or one potential uh, reason for concern is the AV nodal artery, which can run in that space in some patients. And so far, again, we haven't seen that, but it's a potential concern. You know, I, I actually, the, the cases I've done have all been RF. Cryo, is, is that still something you guys are doing or was it effective or have you gone more to RF? In this case, it was effective. Cryo, at least uh, for me, I only use it now whenever I fail radio frequency in intracavitary structures in particular, like the papillary muscle and rarely the moderate of band, and, also, and only really for stability reasons, uh, because it's very rare that we have issues, but sometimes there is an issue to keep the catheter stable, particularly when the uh, arrhythmias are coming from the very tip of the papillary muscles. And in those cases, we use cryo because the catheter sticks to the tissue and is more effective. We report it benefit of that. In this particular area, uh, after we have enough experience with radio frequency now, I don't think that cryo should be the way to go, at least as a first-line therapy. Great. Yeah. Now, uh, this next tracing that you show us, um, you know, it looks like transient heart block uh, associated with ablation in this region. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, what safety parameters you do, how do you uh, avoid this risk, and does ICE help you at all? Yeah, this was actually a case done by our colleague Luis Science from Fondation Cardio Infantil in Bogota. And, uh, and it was again uh, right after we uh, talked about uh, the possibility of ablating in that area, and it was collaborating with us uh, at that point. And here you can see that on an intracardiac echo, the catheter is against the posterior septal process of the coronary sinus, but occasionally that slides a little bit more lateral. In other words, it passes the tracuspid valve. In that phase, when you're going closer to the tracuspid valve, basically, you're really hitting the slow pathway region. And if we are to atrial there, you can potentially uh, damage that. Another possibility on this particular case is that the AV nodal artery was uh, injured and uh, it did recover afterwards. And, uh, uh, but again, it's something to consider. But in our experience with radio frequency, we haven't seen that yet. And also, uh, as you know, I will talk about that going through with a wire and with a balloon, which is 10 millimeter in that specific area. We haven't seen heart block uh, quite yet. So I, I think the compact AV node is uh, remote from that specific region in most patients. And just to orient our viewers a little bit to the ice view in an orientation, which I'm, I'm used to a little bit, uh, you see you know, the aortic valve, you see non coronary cusp, you see left ventricle, um, and then Below the ablation catheter, you point out right the tricuspid valve and going a little bit more ventricularly. Um, so your point is that if you if the ablation catheter is positioned a little bit more ventricularly, more towards slow pathway region, you can see this issue, and ice will help you kind of tease out this anatomy a little bit. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Santangeli. Um, we appreciate your comments on this very very unique region, um, and we'll stay tuned, everyone, for for episode two, focusing on the transeptal puncture.